So thank you, Rolf. So today I'm going to talk you something about owning your reliability. That's a thing which might impact you. Some of you had issues before, some of you haven't had issues before. After this talk, I hope that what you will take away will be the motivation to identify the weak parts in what you do and improve that. So something a little bit about me. I joined Algolia in 2014 when we were just eight. Today we are more than 50. Um, I'm responsible for the infrastructure from the top to the bottom, the network, the hardware, the automation, and the deployment of the applications. I'm also in charge of security, and one of the things which, for someone being responsible for infrastructure is pretty weird, I like to sleep and I like to break stuff. So if it hasn't broken in Algolia, I still haven't managed to touch it. I broke everything that I got my hands on. And why I talk about reliability, this is what we do. We search. We provide search to applications, and you, you know that in many applications, the search is the entry point. You know Google, like you come and you have just the search bar. You come to Amazon and you have just the search. So the fun fact is that today, Amazon's search on Amazon.com was down for four hours. So imagine you come to Amazon, you try to search, and you get 500. Boom. No search. No business. No customers. They go somewhere else. So this is what we do. This is what we do for customers. And we know that our, that our customers rely on us. So when we give them search, they want to be sure that the search works. And that we have some customers, and we have built some infrastructure to base this on. Today, we are doing approximately 20 billion operations, writing changes per month, and we do 12 billion search queries. Not a request to the API, really what you type, what you search on top of the user data. Uh, we have 15 regions, so we are two guys. We have 15 regions. We have over 400 servers in 30, I think the number today is like 38 different data centers, 38 distinct data centers, different buildings, not different availability zones or different recs. Those are different data centers in many countries. So who owns your availability? Easy question. And you know you can find everything on the internet, and internet is always right. So there is a website which, which is going to help you, and it's whoownsmyavailability.com. You open this website, and this website gives you a magical answer who owns your availability. Try it yourself. You will see. You know, you, you, you know these extensions for browsers. It tells you how many visitors the page has, what technologies it uses. Use it in a similar sense. It will tell you, it will tell you who is responsible for your availability. So back to the basics when we talk availability or reliability. We have either dependency or redundancy. Dependent components they impact each other. Redundant components, they embrace each other. But this is how it looks in real life. We have some external services. We have stuff that we have no idea what it does. We have stuff that has no documentation. But this is how it looks. It's a pipeline of your request. That's the request which comes to your service. It goes through your load balancer, through your web servers, through your backend, and then it produces the result. This is how the pipeline looks. But this is not how you want it to look. You want it to look something like this. It looks complex, but every single one of the components is redundant. There is not a single component going down, breaking down the whole system, which is not the case in the previous example. And when we talked about reliability and availability, we mostly talk about SLA or SLO, however you want. So what is the SLA? There is a nice definition by Palo Alto Networks. I'm not a big fan of the Wikipedia definition. So what Palo Alto Network says is a service level agreement is a contract between the service provider and the end user that defines the level of service expected from the service provider. Fair enough. That's something that you sign and that you commit to. This is mostly related to uptime of the service. The provider guarantees that it's going to be up for a certain amount of time throughout the day, month, and year. And in some more advanced environments, and mainly when you own your network and when you control everything in the backend, you can talk about the response time, because you can control it end-to-end. -end. Uh, also, error rate is a, very interesting, is a very interesting SLA. But why do we do this? Why do we do SLA? Why you have to make a contract for a service? You know, you buy a service, the service should work. The reason is that it goes down. And how much costs you a minute of downtime? You know, I. Earlier, I mentioned the search of Amazon was down for four hours. So let's, let's take a look how much it can be. So 
Let's go through some of the common SLA levels that you can see on the market, and then probably a lot of your services that you are using, that you are paying for, apply. I hope you have read the terms and conditions and you know what is the, what is the SLA of every single one of your services. If not, afterwards you will have some time in between the coffees to take a look and read through that. So we will take care about the SLA, that's what the, what the service provider says, this is what I'm gonna guarantee. How much that actually is in time per month, if we consider that, and, a, and a, we have a virtual company that makes $50 million per year. So I don't have the Amazon number, but you can make the nice approximation probably like somehow like that. And how much that projects into a year when you are using the service? So 99%, everybody knows, fair number, that's seven hours per, per month. If a single minute costs you $95, so if you make $50 million per year, that projects into half a million dollars per year. That's quite a lot. Another very common one is uh, three nines. That's 43 minutes. And suddenly, you are at $50,000. Three nines, I guess we agree, is a very good reliability. That's what you see some of the cloud services provide you. Some of, not on the hardware layer, but more on the service layer. Three nines, fair enough. When you want more, when you want more like some companies call it the premium SLA. 99.95, 21 minutes per month. Is it okay? Is it enough for you? You can pay for more. They are also gonna charge you more. The prices of SLA, this is what impacts you, this is how much it costs you. It's not how much you have to pay to your provider. This price is linear. How much you have to pay for better SLA to your provider is exponential. This is what we provide to our customers, this is what we guarantee. So we guarantee four nines. It's approximately four minutes per month. And at that moment you are on a four and a half thousand dollars per month, which seems to st starts to be pretty reasonable. $400 per month, still might be too much. 5.9 also mentioned, it's 26 seconds per month. That's already pretty cool, but most probably no one is really willing to pay for that, and that's probably something that you cannot really do over the internet, that's something that you do internally. The holy grail of uh, availability, the six nines, 2.6 seconds per month, this is awesome. This is something we guarantee to our customers for nines. 99.99. And internally, our internal SLA, in order to provide this for nines, is this, six nines. We cannot restart the service. It has to hot reload, because that might reset the connections, and that might not be okay, and stuff like this. There is also one more SLA that you will see, and you will see it very often, and that's the special marketing level of 100% SLA. <laughs> it's awesome, 100% gonna work all the time. Probably even your connectivity, even if you have a data center connectivity, you don't have a 100% connectivity. You cannot distinguish between your Wi-Fi dropping a packet and the service not being available. So that's when SLA tricks appear. Providers love SLA tricks. So I have picked a couple definitions of uh, some of the services I have seen over the internet, some of them also we use, uh, those are our providers. And I have taken a look what it means, what SLA we have committed to, and what it really is. 100% uptime, but the definition says 5% refund after each 0 0.05, which is 99.95, because everything below, point, below 0 0.05 doesn't count. There are even better, there are like great cloud providers with like a super high availability and they guarantee you a crazy 99.9. .9. But the downtime counts if backend responds with error during two consecutive 90 second intervals. So it has to be done for one and a half minutes to start counting. So if it is down for one minute, then it works for 30 seconds, and then it's down for one minute, doesn't count. Those are not two consecutive intervals. 99.8. Not that cool, huh? So. When you have an SLA, and that's what your pro provider commits, or you are making a service and you want to provide the SLA to your customers, you have to monitor the SLA. But suddenly it starts to be complicated. Where do you monitor the SLA? You cannot monitor the SLA from the inside of your network. To a certain extent, you can see some stuff. 
but you have to observe what the customer sees. And that's when independent monitoring comes into play. Um, probably you are familiar with Pingdom. That's a pretty good best effort monitoring once per minute. It's going to test your service if, if it works, if the ping responds, if the, if the HTTP return code is 200. That's OK. Two seconds might be nice. But if you are reaching for five nines, six nines, that's not enough. That doesn't fit into the interval. It cannot detect this stuff. Uh, earlier this day, uh, Jorge from Server Density had a talk about uh, war gaming. Server Density also has probes. They can check from multiple locations. At the same time, they can test that your service is available. If you want to go a step forward, and you are really curious where the issue is coming from, there is a project called Thousand Eyes, and they can give you a very detailed overview of what is going on. It's a synthetic traffic from their probes, but it gives you the whole trace route in a nice graphical way, and you will see here is the issue. This affects this number of servers. You will even see when you will, from all their probes, test your server, where is the weak point? Because you might discover that although you have two uplinks, they actually go to the same router, and from there it goes to the rest of the internet. So you still have two uplinks, but you have a single point of failure. With this, you can see it. If you want to go a step further, there is a very interesting project, uh, an interesting company called Kentic. And they can do analysis of your net flow traffic. So it's not a synthetic traffic. They can analyze the real traffic which is coming to your network, and they can visualize it in a very similar way as Thousand Eyes can. This way, it's your real traffic. Those are real users. You can see the response time. You see the autonomous system where they come from. Very interesting project. If you want to do an on-demand scans, a Turbobytes Pulse is pretty good. They have a nice web page. You put there your IP address or your domain name, and it launches the test from all around the world, and it gives you trace routes and the pings to your server. And you can take a look. Maybe you have issue from Netherlands. Maybe you have issue from Germany. They have probes in Netherlands. They have probes in Germany. You're going to see if these specific networks which they have are impacted. Or you can go with custom monitoring. Since we had pretty strict requirements for SLA, we built our own network. And we are running 44 servers around the world, tiny VPS, running our probing software. And every single one of them is checking our whole infrastructure every four seconds for availability. If it detects that one of the servers is down, it immediately fires to our monitoring and reports this server is down, something is going on. Sufficient amount of probes detects that the server is down, the server starts to drain connections, and we have to react on that. So today, we are monitoring 1.6 thousand metrics just watching our DNS providers, watching their name servers, how, do, how quickly they respond. Because your DNS provider most probably have multiple name servers. Do all of them respond th at the same speed? We have seen differences in 10 milliseconds. We have seen differences in an order of 100 to 200 milliseconds in between the same name servers of a single provider. We are watching our own, our own API. And there we collect 3.3 thousand metrics, so it already starts to grow. And then we are checking the network. From all the 45 locations to all our servers, we are collecting close to 73 thousand metrics that are automatically analyzed for latency anomalies. And this way, we can be pretty sure that what we deliver to our customers is what we have committed to. But you have to watch it. If you commit to something, you have to watch it, and you need to prove that you have done it correctly. So let me ask you a question. Who runs a server? I assume that those that don't put their hands up, you are serverless, you have totally different issues, you are very abstract. So who runs a server? OK. Keep the hands up, please. And who can restart a server, any server, anytime, without impacting customers? <laughs> wow. OK. The rest, hands up. Who can restart any rack anytime? The whole rack, 42, 46 machines. OK? Who can restart any data center? Drop the whole data center anytime. Awesome. 
We have one, respect. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 15 regions. Uh, out of those 15 regions, we have one that we still cannot restart any data center. In the rest of them, we can restart up to two data centers, carefully selected, and that would be okay. But any data center, we can restart in 14 regions. And it's fun. Data centers go down. And no matter what your provider says, the data center will go down eventually. And when it goes down, you want to be sure that your service is going to continue working. So here are some of the underestimated dependencies that we rely on, but sometimes we don't realize that those are the dependencies that, we, that are there. Normally, you are trying to put servers in multiple racks. That's kind of the baseline. You have the identification of the rack, and you don't want to have the same top of the rack switch, so you put it to multiple racks. But sometimes the racks are not completely independent. Maybe the whole row goes down. Then you start to, then you request what? You request to have it in a different LE or in a different server room. The network, the network is always the issue. Uh, mainly if you, if you are in a multi-tenant network, you can have a rogue DHCP servers. People start to take your IP addresses if you are in a shared address space. And you should detect that at least, if nothing else. But your application, if your server goes down, should be still OK. That's also when someone hijacks your IP address and you are not encrypting traffic inside your data center. Wow, you have a very interesting issue. Um, recently, it started to be um, our first questions with our, with our providers that we are looking around the world. And that is, OK, it's cool. We can order a server. But can we choose in which rack the server is going to be? We want to hand pick in your data center where we want to put our server. Because today we order one, then we order 10 servers, and we order 50 of them. And if you are going to put the 10 into the same rack, that's a one server for us. There is one top of the rack switch. The switch goes down, you lost 10 servers. So it starts to be a thing, and ask your providers, can you choose where in the data center the servers can be located? Some providers will even give you the schematics of the data center with the power distribution, with the network distribution, and they will show you what are the availability zones and what are the risk zones of their data center. And at the end of the day, you will discover actually the majority of them are like, fine with that. You want one server on that side of the data center and the other one on the opposite side of the data center? Oh yeah, fine. We don't care. But if you go through the online form and you order two of them, of course, they are going to put them uh, one by one because it's the fastest way how to do it. And that's when you will be already asking for the plans. You know, often you take a look like how the electricity is redundant. Do they have diesel aggregators? And what is the physical security? Take a look how the air conditioning is being done. You will be very surprised because one day, and it happened to us, you end up with a server that just starts to produce into syslog, the CPU is overheating. And you're like, okay, what do you mean CPU is overheating? Server starts rebooting and then the provider is like, oh yes, sorry. Our AC broke down in this, in this corner of the data center. Okay, we got one server impacted. We have 200 servers with the provider. The AC was properly designed. But if it would have been in the same container, in the same section of the data center, in the same server room, and the AC would not be redundant enough, you start losing more machines. In different racks, you have handpicked, but you forgot about the AC. And again, the network. The cables are always broken. Like, I don't know how, how the data centers are being built. Every single data center has an imp which is taking out the cables all the time. <laughs> you, have a, yeah, really, you have a server, you get it delivered, the cable works, two weeks after, doesn't. So you ask the support, what is going on? Oh, the cable was out. What do you mean the cable was out? So I have seen data centers and they actually, they are using a silicon with the cable and they put the cable and then they silicon the cable inside just to be sure that uh, the cable doesn't go out because it's very annoying to, to change it. But very often you might end up with providers that had different sorts of customers 
And maybe the customer didn't want a gigabit port. Maybe the customer didn't want to pay for gigabit port. But the customer is gone, and maybe you ended up on the switch, on the same switch port that the previous customer was. And the port is just locked into 100 megabits. If you buy a server, and they tell you you're going to get the gigabit connectivity, do you test that the port is in gigabit? Or it can pretty much be in 100 megabits. It can be in 100 megabits half duplex, and you might not notice unless you check that, this, that the network connectivity is really like this. And the funny thing is, when you have a server with like a OK load, you have a couple tens of megabits on the load, that's like normal, that's fine. Boom. Suddenly, you need to make a backup, or the server crashes and you need to recover it. Wow. At that moment, you don't want to discover that you have 50 megabits of, uh, of bandwidth to the server, and you need to transfer a couple hundreds of gigabytes of data. The very interesting ones are network maintenance issues. You know, you run a lot of servers, you have nothing local, you have running clusters, so the network is omnipresent. The worst one are the unplanned maintenances. A data center goes down. Yeah. OK. A line card went down, and they have to replace it. That can happen. That can impact a large portion of the data center. That can impact the whole availability zone. But the funnier ones are the planned ones, but they forgot to tell you that it's going to be one. <laughs> because very often, you are going to be buying a service, or let's say connectivity, maybe not from the tier one provider, but from a tier two, or from a tier three. And we have seen this before. The tier one forgot to tell our provider there is going to be a maintenance. And boom, you lose a data center. The local probes are saying the data center is up, but you cannot reach the data center. So ask them what's going on, and they're like, oh, we don't know. You reached out to the provider, and they're like, oh, of course, there is a maintenance. Like, no, there is no maintenance. Yes, there is a maintenance. Well, oh, we forgot to send you an email. Yeah, but your data center died. They forgot, to they forgot to tell your provider. And of course, at that moment, your provider is not going to tell you because they don't know. And the last ones are the failing ones. So it was a nice morning. I took a look at our monitoring. And I don't know why, right at the moment when I opened, uh, when I opened the Slack channel, I started to get messages, server down, another one, another one. And then it continued, 100 servers. It's like, wow, that's not OK. So you check the calendar. There is no planned maintenance. No one knows anything. So it was the first time I actually managed to find the, the phone number for, this, for the support. And I was like, guys, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but your data center in Ashburn is down. And they are like, oh, yeah, we know. It's like, OK, cool. Uh, what's going on? Oh, there is a maintenance. I was like, OK, what do you mean maintenance? Yeah, you know, uh, the maintenance is not going as expected, so we are right now thinking about stopping the maintenance and recovering the previous state. Like, wow, 30 minutes, that's, that's a hardcore brainstorming, you know, like uh, when you have killed your customers. But okay, that can happen. So probably you have noticed we run everything bare metal. We run all the servers on our own. So the easy answer to all our issues is run in the cloud. You know, that's the way. But guess what? The clouds are not error-proof. And no matter how it looks, you will not find the cloud that is error-proof. AWS. Um, Route leak, Malaysia Telecom, AWS US East One disappeared from the internet, was routed to Malaysia. Your servers work. The electricity is OK. The AC is fine. But your network has no idea how to reach the data center. Uh, a, couple months, uh, a couple months ago, DynamoDB broke. And you know, everything is super redundant. Everything is like many services, backend replicated. Everything is fine. Up till you discover that almost every single service relies on the DynamoDB. And if that one broke, the cascade effect followed, and everything broke apart. That's, if you have ever seen like an Amazon status page, that's like when the green tick changes to the green tick with the tiny uh, eye. That means it doesn't work. <laughs> then there is, a, and there is a second state when it is yellow. That means it doesn't work, and we admit it doesn't work. 
Um, so you have alternatives. You can use Google Cloud Platform. But I don't know how the guys managed to, but it was um, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, a sequence of lightning strikes put the data center out. Like the probability of, I'm not sure it was like four, four lightning strikes hit the same spot in like a couple seconds. They even lost some data. Like you cannot really blame them, right? Like, you know, like <laughs> who, would, who would design for this? Like, what is the probability that this is going to happen? But okay, it happens. But some time ago, they also had a, like a, a network issues. It's, it's always the network. I don't know. It's always the network. A network issue took down all the regions of GCP around the world. Amazon had network issues, but always isolated to a single region. In this case, all the regions were impacted at once. That's a big problem. Now, the interesting thing is a uh, lot of providers are pushing multiple availability zones in a single region. And they are like, okay, this is the best practice. This is how are you supposed to design applications. And it's interesting to see how their rhetorics change and the best practices change at the moment when there is an outage of the region. When they say, oh, yes, but you should be also multi-region, like we just forgot to tell you. Because we cannot guarantee the region to be up. When the route leak happens, basically what Amazon said was like, yes, if you design your application properly, you are multi-region, right? And you just like flip to a different region. Yeah. How many of you have a multi-region application? East coast, west coast. Between Amsterdam and Germany. Between Sydney and Singapore. Some of the systems don't really work over these long links. They need, the latency is pretty high. Azure has outages. Uh, sorry, Microsoft. Um, Salesforce has outages. This is a funny one, because that kind of doesn't impact uh, operations people or developers. That impacts the business guys, and they're like, okay, like, my Salesforce doesn't work. And then they come to IT people in the company, or operations people, and they're like, Salesforce doesn't work. And it's like, yeah, like, what do you want me to do? It's an external service. They run it. There have been multiple issues. EU region switched to read-only. But still okay. But in case of a very recent one, um, North America region, boom, down, multiple hours. You have SLA, that's cool. They're going to reimburse you. So if you pay them 10K per month, they're going to give you 2K back. But, you know, that's, that's what you sign it up for. You can change, or maybe actually you cannot, so. You name it, whatever service, everything goes down. Everything. There is like nothing which stays up all the time. And you have to count with that. But the great thing is, we live in the age of APIs. Use them. The APIs are great because you can suddenly start using multiple providers. With a certain level of abstraction, you can get rid of the stuff of spawning instances by a single provider. Spawn the instances across multiple providers. Don't configure your security groups just for a single provider. Configure them across. And there has never been an issue that two cloud providers would go down at the same time or had an issue in the same region. It can still happen, but who would blame them, right? And the network is always the network. Like, we have seen issue that um, one of our providers was, um, was paying for the special peering with Amazon, you know, this direct connect. But this thing broke. So we have a different provider that has a much worse connectivity but for many hours, it was way better just because the direct peering was broken. So you pay extra money to get better service. But still, this is the weak point. We have seen a provider receiving a default route from a new peer. Boom. All the internet goes over a 10 gigabit link. Doesn't really work. Malaysia Telecom, I have already mentioned before. A funny one is uh, a Cloudflare one. You know, they are saying that they are, they are routing like 5% uh, of the worldwide traffic when they were deploying their new POP in Doha, due to a tiny misconfiguration, uh, all the traffic suddenly started to go to Doha. So if you imagine 5% of the internet, the infrastructure was not really ready to, to handle that traffic. <laughs> so the, it's a cool thing. Like You can find a lot of solutions, but invest your time to studying TCP proxies, HA proxy, stuff like that. It will be really a great friend. You can have just the VPS just to bounce the traffic through somewhere else. It's going to solve many of your issues. And I have one in here. 
This was a funny one. Uh, we got a servers in San Jose, and we got a customer in Oregon, in uh, AWS US West uh, 2 region. And so we got approximately 21 milliseconds of latency. So this is how the packet went from San Jose to Boardman and then to Seattle, and from Seattle it went back. But suddenly the customer reached out and says, hey, we have a high latency. And I'm like, okay. What's going on? So they send us a graph coming from their new Redic, and uh, this is what we saw. And we we're like, wow, that's not okay. And the latency jumped to like 150, close to 300 milliseconds in, uh, in places, and you are like, everything is okay. So we reached out to all our providers, and we are like, guys, do you know any, about any issue which might be causing this? I'm like, no. We reached out to Amazon. Guys, do you know about any issue that might be causing this? No. Okay. So that's cool. So this is what happened. Um, the, the provider of Amazon in Seattle rerouted the traffic uh, via Denver in Colorado, and on the way decided to drop 20% of the packets. So if you have a UDP traffic, okay, you lose 20% of the packets. If you have a TCP, you suddenly start to have packet loss, you have retransmissions, which causes a high latency. The traffic goes through eventually, but it takes some time, some retransmissions. Um, here is a trace route, how it went, so Seattle, Denver, and San Jose, and then we got to our this web server in, uh, in San Jose, so everything was fine on our side. All the network teams were alerted, looking at if there is an issue. But we reached out to Amazon and we said, hey guys, there is an issue, and they're like, no, it's out of our network. Like, okay, but it's your provider. Oh, can you contact them? Like, no, it's your provider. Okay. <laughs> they contacted them, the next day they came back and they said, like, oh, okay. They confirmed there is an issue, they are going to fix it. Cool. At this moment, it was really cool because our customer in, um, in the AWS region was really desperate and they really needed a great latency. And it happened to me for the first time talking to a customer like this. They were like, okay, what is the solution? We have deployed a proxy to a different provider. It always ended up in the same Seattle router. Multiple different providers, multiple different level uh, tier one providers. It always ended up in Seattle. So the customer asked, okay, what do we have to do? Like, tell me what we have to do and we are going to do it. We need the latency back. And I'm like, can you deploy your whole application in US East? It was pretty, pretty brave to ask them to switch everything to a different region. And the, and the customer was like, oh yeah, sure. Like, wow. And he, he, started, he started to prepare the migration of everything from one region to another one. And they were like, okay, we don't care if we are West or East. Like, oh, okay. That could solve it. But luckily, before we managed to agree on the details, uh, it got resolved, and uh, I got a nice box of chocolate from the customer. It was pretty cool. <laughs> so, networking 101. What happens when you put uh, algolia.com to your browser and you hit enter? <coughs> DNS, the main thing. No DNS, no new connections. It's a very nice target for DDoS attacks. It's super common. Every single DNS provider is DDoS all the time. It's based on UDP. You lose the packet, boom, no retransmission. You have to retry. Your application has to retry. The interesting question is, do you know how your application handles DNS timeouts? Have you ever tried to resolve something which, doesn't, which times out during resolving, simulate a DDoS attack? You will discover that in multiple languages it behaves different way. Sometimes it depends on the settings of the operating system, and sometimes not. Sometimes it's counted to the connect time, sometimes it's not. Sometimes the connect time starts to count after the DNS resolution is finished. So, suddenly, you have a timeout of one second, but it might be 21 seconds, because the operating system was waiting for the DNS that does not respond. And, you know, you can have multiple DNS providers, and you should do it. The funny thing is, Amazon.com doesn't use Route 53. They still have two DNS providers, but neither of them is a Route 53. So, interesting. So you can do it. Find a DNS provider with an API, push your records via an API. Please, don't configure anything via web UIs of DNS providers. It's a, that doesn't work. Do an API, find DNS providers with API, find two of them, push the records twice, configure multiple name servers, fine. Suddenly you have two providers, two network teams, two different independent DDoS mitigation techniques. You should be fine. Take a look at some of the huge sites running around the internet. Huge sites like Alexa 100. 
you will see that vast majority of them have two DNS providers. But already when you design a software, you should consider some stuff. And for some people it comes as a surprise. Like simple things like TCP checksum. It doesn't always work. You might still end up with corrupted data. The probability is one in 16 million to 10 billion. But okay, if you are sending thousands of packets per second, yeah, you're gonna hit it. And you will end up with corrupted packets. Use SSL. Um, encrypt the data inside your network. DNS resolving, as I mentioned, doesn't work 100%. What happens to your application when it doesn't work? And many developers rely on the thing that the DNS resolution works. And then their application continues. Normally, you will see a lot of code where it is like a try-catch, but the open of the connection is before that, or the resolution is before that, and it's not being caught. Or it throws a very different exception. And when you are making a call to the service, does it always return 200? What your application does when the service you are calling doesn't return 200? Should it retry? Should it disable the service? And also, a lot of API clients, or a lot of HTTP clients, sorry, um, have implicit timeouts. Are you setting explicitly timeouts for every single request? Because this is a time bomb. It works until it doesn't. And then everything terribly breaks because you discover that some languages have a default timeout of like 60 seconds. And that's an inline request that you are doing in processing of the page. Normally, it can take 10 milliseconds. Suddenly, 60 seconds and everything is blocked. And you are waiting for the call to finish. Take a look at timeouts. Start setting timeouts explicitly. Be in control of your timeouts. Software operation is also an interesting area because you have the software and suddenly you have to, you have to work with it in the production. You can end up with broken package repositories. Those of you that like, work with Node.js are aware of the NPM issue. Package disappears. Uh, from time to time, it happens that Debian repositories have a corrupted package with the dependencies that you cannot resolve. So you fetch the first package, you install the package, boom, and then you cannot resolve. You try to remove it, but hey, you have to fulfill the, the dependency. And a lot of projects that are keeping their own repositories, they don't always keep all the versions. So if you have a version locked in production, you might end up with the repository actually not having the version anymore because they are keeping like the last five. But you don't care. You want the version which is half a year old because that's still fine. There was no security issue. It's just like features being added. But if they keep the last five, you might not get the version at the moment you need it. A very interesting question. Who can deploy when GitHub is down? Wow, and the rest, uh, uh. <laughs> it's, it's recently, like one of my colleague's friends joined GitHub, and since then, boom. I don't know what he does, you know. We are, we are really blaming him, like uh, GitHub is down, and we are like, Dustin, come on, like, uh, tell your friend to stop uh, messing up with the system, but really, it fits, it correlates. I see the correlation in between. So really, invest into introducing mistakes in your system intentionally introduce mistakes. You have heard a lot about these chaos monkeys of uh, Netflix. You can just have a script which randomly restarts the server or kills the service. Like, kill all Java. I always see what happens, like, you know? <laughs> and I came with like a, a very ugly thing which I did to my colleagues. I have by accident injected this into our IP table in a wrong order. It was supposed to be after some record. It has an interesting side effect. Once in a while, the DNS resolving fails for a few seconds. And then it works. So if you have an application which is, which is processing like a couple hundreds of requests per second, wow, some of them fail. And by the time the developer is able to see the application running and failing, it's fixed. He's like, wow. So he goes to the machine, tries to resolve, it works. Logs out, boom, doesn't work again. So he gets in, and by the time the developer gets to the machine, it doesn't work. Or it works. It's, you will see a lot of crazy theories, like, every time I try it, it doesn't work. Well, really? <laughs> and then you find this, it's like, really, every time you try it, it didn't work? You were just lucky. It's a one line in your IP tables. It causes, like, uh, to us, it costs 0.2% 
failure in uh, DNS resolutions, we have improved so much of our code to be resilient to failing DNS resolutions. It's great, it's really great. The last thing are people, because you already make everything redundant. You have multiple data centers, multiple providers, multiple DNS providers, multiple internets, whatever. But what about the bus factor of your company? How many people can get hit by bus and your company continues working? Because if you have a person and he holds the knowledge to your critical system and he gets hit by a bus, what's, what's next? You need to increase your bus factor. You need to have a sufficient amount of people that hold the knowledge and a certain portion of them can get hit by bus. One of my former colleagues, when he used to work in, a, in Moldova for um, an ISP, they were eight sysadmins, and when they were going for a company party, they had to go in two different cars. You know, <laughs> just in case. Uh, when there is an issue, do your people that manage the systems, do they know what to do? Do they know where to find the information? Do they know who to reach out to? This is very important. Because sometimes everything works, it's like, yeah, it works. Learn this, learn how to fix the system. Ah, come on, it works. You know, it's 100% SLA, it works, I don't have to learn that, it's never going to go down. Then it goes down and people are like, well, do we have a documentation or do we have a process for that or what should we do? Should we, should we call someone? Mainly, should we inform our customers? So, I will end up with this wonderful quote from Sidney Decker, everything that can break will work and then we will make wrong assumptions about the reliability. Deal with that, let that sink. Do you have any questions? No questions. I'm fine with it. There's one yes. in front. Throw him the mic. Oh, yeah, can I? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so last year I've been to um, like Amazon and Google and had like free cloud seminars. And there's a saying that friends don't let friends build data centers. Oh yeah, I got a t-shirt like that from Amazon. Yeah, it's very funny. And um, so I guess the question is, um, how do you know when to, you know, when, do, when is it better to use a cloud and when is it time to build your own data center um, or, or, is there, or should yeah. he, we consider a hybrid solution? All right, uh, if Jesse allows me to take her slot, I will take the next 45 minutes uh, and we can <laughs> discuss that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I didn't mean it. Um, no, let's discuss it. It's a, it's a really large, uh, large topic, a pretty wide topic. I have a lot of opinions on that. So I don't want them to be recorded. <laughs> 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 but definitely, Thank you. definitely we can discuss that. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Any more questions? Nope. All right. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Adam.